Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, speak a bit outside of uh, what we typically consider to be uh, ecology context and, and wildlife context. Um, I want to focus a bit on uh, elements that um, we believe need further support and, and need to be integrated into future work to understand disease ecology, and that, that is uh, angles related to uh, livestock production, value chains, and movements of poultry, which, which feed the process of disease dynamics uh, and serve as a, an opportunity for interface between wildlife, livestock, and people. And you can see um, there's a, a large list of co-authors. Uh, these are all colleagues from FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, who focus on different elements of uh, livestock health and, um, and disease prevention and control. And what I'll talk about briefly is zoonotic diseases, uh, how wildlife and disease ecology uh, studies have included elements of, of interface with livestock. Uh, but then I want to talk about how livestock and value chains uh, are, are part of this bigger picture. And it's probably the area that we're weakest at. In, in integrating good data and having good data, but perhaps uh, with the advances in technology uh, that are available now uh, and our understanding of disease ecology, we can think of creative ways to build this in and integrate this into the work in the future. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, disease emergence, amplification, and spillover, just to give you an idea of where we'd like to target some of this work. And then finally, some examples and conclusions. Um, <clears throat> as many of you probably already know, most human diseases, uh, more than 60% of them, uh, are actually zoonotic pathogens that come from animals, either wildlife or livestock, and then they jump into people. Uh, and while we know that this is happening, there's been little effort to really identify the nodes of contact or the points of interface between uh, wildlife, livestock, and people. And we think that this is a, a very important area for us to, to move into. Um, we also recognize that the demographics of the world continues to evolve, and uh, the food security demands that are out there are going to result in increased needs for livestock production. And uh, we're talking about needing to increase animal-based protein by 50%. Uh, we're looking at 30 billion livestock animals uh, predicted by 2020. So where do you put these animals? Where do you make more food? Uh, you have two options. You either spread it out and cover more land, or you intensify in the locations where production is occurring. In either case, uh, you're creating greater opportunity for interphase and for disease transmission, potentially, from animals being produced out to wildlife or to people, or in uh, any of the other directions back into livestock. And <clears throat> if you look at the, uh, the, the global growth um, and demand for poultry, just poultry alone, you can see that uh, large demand is in Southeast and South Asia. Uh, but there are other places in the world that, uh, that basically will have these same dynamics uh, based on what the predictions are. And so you already can start to understand where uh, interphase <coughs> issues will become more relevant. And I think that uh, while we want to balance the demand for more food, we have to do it in a, in a bit of a responsible way to ensure uh, ecological services are protected and that the environment and, and health of people is, is in mind. Uh, and this really uh, speaks to needing to manage disease runoff or runoff from farms, <coughs> management of increased production, and really trying to think about how to prevent um, pathogen spread from animals to people. And we know that modifications of natural habitats and changes in agricultural production, uh, these are the two main drivers so far to date that are really driving zoonotic disease uh, issues in people. And this is a, a map just showing um, um, locations of uh, infectious disease events. And you can see that uh, it's in both the developing and the developed countries of the world. And so this is a global issue. This is not just an issue for countries that uh, are lower income and developing. This is a global issue for us. 
And if you look at uh, where relative risk is, um, then you start to see uh, slightly different patterns depending on whether you're talking about diseases coming from wildlife, vector-borne diseases, or uh, diseases coming potentially from livestock. But, but the, the preliminary work that's, that's out there really suggests that uh, we have some understanding of where we need to focus our future efforts geospatially. Um, if we think about migration, uh, what does migration uh, represent? Well, if, if you look at a lot of these zoonotic pathogens in people, they're not actually pathogens. They're not causing illness or sickness in wildlife. They're part of the normal flora. Um, animals coexist with many uh, virus, bacteria, et cetera. And so um, what, it, what it means is that uh, as animals move in their normal movement patterns, or in adapted movement patterns due to changes in, in climate or uh, landscape or what have you, uh, they take with them the potential pathogens. And so migration represents an opportunity for them to potentially move things to new locations or to introduce them to other animals that they come into contact with people being one of those. Uh, and finally, I think there's an important point to remember that migration requires a lot of energy. And uh, there's been work to show that uh, immune function uh, is, is affected through migration. And this can make either animals more susceptible to pathogens if they get exposed upon the end of migration. Uh, or alternatively, if they are existing with a pathogen in them that's not causing a problem, they may be more susceptible to shedding and therefore spill over from those animals out into, uh, into the environment or to other animals. Um, Diane mentioned uh, this influenza A cycle earlier. Basically, we know wild birds are the low path reservoirs. Uh, we think that they introduce low path viruses into the agricultural sector, which then mutate into high path uh, uh, viruses and then go back out into the wild uh, population. And so this cycle is ongoing. Uh, I think it's really beyond now, in the science anyway, beyond the point of pointing fingers at wildlife, pointing fingers at livestock. I mean, this is an integrated system. It will never be separated. Livestock and wildlife will continue to interface. And, uh, and really what we need to do is figure out how to best manage these dynamics uh, in light of this reality, because it's not going to go away, not in our lifetime anyway. Uh, and you've seen this map, which shows the work that we've done thus far. Um, and Diane just showed you. Uh, this picture on the Tibetan plateau clearly demonstrating interphase taking place between migratory geese and farmed geese. Um, and uh, again, we're really interested in this interphase. Where does wildlife and livestock meet? And if you're a pathogen and you're thinking about where you want to set up shop, uh, I think from a biomass standpoint, you can see that livestock uh, is the right place to be if you want to have a lot of good options. Uh, wildlife is not necessarily a good place to, uh, to host yourself. Um, and I think with what we're seeing at a global level, right, we have declining wildlife populations and increasing livestock populations. So this will be even more dramatic in the future. So let's talk about uh, livestock production for a few minutes. And uh, why do we care about value chains? Well. Um, in the most simple sense, we talk about value chains meaning from farm to fork or farm to chopsticks in the Asian context. And these are the, along these value chains, um, viruses uh, or, or potential diseases can emerge, amplify, or spill over. And our, our challenge is to understand where these dynamics of disease changes occur and to be able to track them and then manage them. And uh, it's really necessary uh, to understand the value chains in detail, and this is where I think we have a lot of room for improvement. Um, don't get scared by this, but this starts to give you the complexity of what we're dealing with. So uh, maybe we're all biologists and ecologists. We study wild bird migrations, and we think that they're difficult to manage mentally. Uh, when you start to put together a schematic of a value chain, uh, you get into trouble also, and you see the challenges you're up against. So, you know, in, in a very simple sense, you know, you may have small producers and uh, they bring animals to middlemen or collection locations and then eventually they go on to slaughterers and then go to, or wet markets, 
and then to either consumers, restaurants, uh, in Vietnam, pho, our local soup. Um, you know, this is actually a big core group of people that make use of some of the poultry that's produced. Uh, very little food, uh, poultry, goes to supermarkets these days. And so we, we can't apply necessarily the paradigms and the way that food is produced and the way that we access food as consumers here in North America with many of the other countries that uh, we're challenged to work within. Uh, from, from a management of value chains. And so we need to really take a local perspective and understand uh, cultural settings and, and also the way of life. Um, and value chains also are not necessarily restricted to one country. There are many cross-border value chains. Um, some of them are legal. Many of them are illegal or informal, as we would rather call them, uh, because... Uh, you know, the, the reality is that uh, borders are often not defined uh, by fences, and uh, many people have family living on two sides of a border. They share farms, they share animals, um, you know, family members are back and forth regularly. So these are, these are challenging reality dimensions. Um, some of the work that uh, we've been doing um, to date have looked at the movement of poultry that's produced uh, sometimes in northern parts of China and moves down south, and this is network analyses that look at where the highest market turnovers are occurring in poultry, and this is in particular for spent hens. More recently in Vietnam, we've then looked at the road system that connects China with Vietnam, and this has been what our major concern is with H7N9. How will that virus make its way into Vietnam if it comes? Um, <coughs> and then finally, this is the destination. These are all the markets. Uh, that occur uh, where we, we think that potentially uh, incoming birds through value chains, through poultry trade and poultry movements, uh, could potentially arrive, uh, some of them as far away as northern China, but moving down into this area and basically resulting in introduction of a virus through the, through the value chain. <coughs> um, I also mentioned that production systems are different. So you have Traditionally, in this part of the world, high-tech um, intensive production. Uh, in that part of the world, you have much more low-tech, less biosecure production systems. Uh, animals then go on to processing. You can have big slaughterhouses, uh, or you can have backyard slaughtering, or anything in between. And then finally, how do you get access to the animals or to the food at a supermarket, at a live animal market, or through uh, other media? And so this just gives you an idea of uh, areas where the value chain exists. And what I wanted to point out is that we have opportunities for both emergence at some of these locations and also spillover of pathogens out into other sectors. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is just, again, um, I don't want to go through all the details, but what I want to show you is where we have potential pathogens in the system whether it be at uh, farms, uh, moving through uh, from farms onto the live animal markets, which is very common, uh, and then amplification, because many people are bringing many birds from many different places all to these single sites, these live bird markets. They all mix. They're all in contact. Some of them go off for sale. Some of them stay there for a day. Some of them sleep there overnight and are there the next day. Some go back to farms. Some go to this market and then get moved to another market. So you can see <coughs> that the opportunity for tracking them and understanding where they go and where they may go with the pathogens that they carry, this is really a key area for us to focus on in the future. <coughs> so uh, with, our, with our value chains, we really want to try to understand from a specific location, where did animals come from and where do they go to? And we believe that uh, the new technologies that are available will allow us to do that more and more for poultry movement, uh, particularly chickens and ducks. <coughs> uh, and then finally, uh, once we're done with these understandings, we then can move to a management uh, dimension, which then helps us prevent disease in both animals and people. Um, <coughs> While this is not a value chain, um, this is very reflective of the cross-border value chains that I showed you pictures of earlier, which represented poultry movements. What this is actually a picture of is the different virus clades that we're busy tracking. 
And just like the poultry or just like the wild birds, there are no national borders that matter. And so this is uh, the distribution of different clades and how they're moving around depending on which clade of virus we're talking about. Uh, and our challenge is to try to figure out if it's associated with poultry, with wild birds, or with people, or with fomites, uh, inanimate objects that maybe are contaminated and moving. So in the duck production systems in the lower Mekong between Cambodia and uh, Vietnam, um, this is really an area that has intensive domestic duck production. And, and these animals are basically traveling 10 to 400 kilometers uh, regularly. Uh, there's two different types of production. Some are for meat, some are for eggs. Uh, but what, what's important to understand is that they're moving uh, after three weeks of age for maybe up to 10 weeks or up to two years, depending on which type of animals they are, all in rice fields. And <coughs> you can see that um, we really can't determine the border in the rice fields in the area. Uh, there's usually a herder moving these birds. Uh, and you can see that once the birds go, this is the Vietnam side, once they go across the border, they're there for months or weeks, and then they come back. And once they come back, this starts to give you an idea of the distribution and the problem that we're dealing with. What's particularly interesting is that uh, recently, in the last year or so, there have been uh, only a handful of deaths on the Vietnam side of the border uh, from H5N1, uh, highly pathogenic influenza, in people. On the Cambodia side, uh, I think there's been about 30 deaths. It's the same virus. It's the same clade of virus. What's creating that difference in the mortality on the two sides of the border when essentially, from, from what we can see, it looks the same? And these are the sorts of questions that we can start to try to understand <coughs> if we have a bit more detail on the, on the movements of the livestock in particular. Because most of the people that are getting infected are coming into contact with poultry and getting infected from poultry exposure, not from wild bird exposure. And so this is where we see added value for this type of work. Um, just to get away from birds for a moment and talk about bats, um, this is the uh, distribution of uh, flying fox um, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the Hinepa virus zone uh, in Southeast and South Asia. <coughs> and what you can see <clears throat> is that uh, this is another disease. Again, Nipa is not a problem for bats. It's a problem when it gets into people. How is it getting into people? Well, in Malaysia, um, it moved from bats to pigs to people. And, and you can see with these numbers, I mean, um, mortalities of people, obviously a lot, but uh, economic impacts, 120 plus million. And uh, ultimately, this has implications for conservation, right? Now bats are the enemy because they're seen as the reservoir for the virus. But actually, um, <clears throat> the bats... Uh, the bats didn't really uh, bring this on. What actually took place were aspects related to landscape changes and uh, differences in, uh, in different habitat use that brought bats or attracted bats to pig farms. Um, so bats are foraging <coughs> on uh, fruit trees that are in pig farms where new intensive farming is taking place. This allowed for transmission, and then ultimately the pigs got sick and then it fed on to people. And so uh, if you look at behavior of people uh, and decision-making processes, these are preventable events. These are preventable things. And so if we had the understanding of these issues ahead of time, we could better plan where to farm, uh, what not to do, what, not, what species not to bring together to create potential zoonotic disease issues. And so. That's where we, we need to be thinking in the future as we go ahead. <clears throat> and uh, just to build on the bat work, uh, there's also been recently some work on Ebola Reston virus. Um, it's not the same exact Ebola virus that's killing people in Guinea right now, but uh, it is uh, an Ebola virus that's found in bats. Again, uh, bats being the potential reservoir but, uh, well, being the reservoir, but the disease not causing a problem in bats, okay? Bats live with it, they do fine. However, if these diseases spill over, come into contact with pigs or transmit to people, then we start to see problems. And so, in this case, 
Um, fortunately, this Ebola virus doesn't have an effect on people, but it did cost uh, the government of the Philippines a lot of money because it got into the pig population, and then they had difficulty exporting pigs. And uh, we have other work uh, in Thailand and in Vietnam on bats, trying to understand habitat use, movement ecology, and applications to disease dynamics. And we'd like to build on that work. <coughs> and that's being done to a large extent with Max Planck Institute and um, several of the government agencies uh, in each of the respective countries and some of the university partners as well. So um, <coughs> this, is, uh, this is Poyang Lake that Diane mentioned. Looks like a, a relatively innocuous place. Um, what you see is a lot of wetland habitat, but what is overlaid is millions of wild birds, farmed wild birds, domestic birds, uh, domestic chickens as well as ducks, and pigs and people. So this for me is the perfect storm. This is where we have the opportunity for influenza dynamics to really uh, have major, major, di major mixing, major exchange of viruses. <laughs> and this is just a picture of one of the farming systems and uh, we've done some preliminary work looking at habitat use of the domestic ducks and, and how wild birds that are marked also are overlapping and, and potentially uh, exchanging viruses, but certainly sharing, sharing the habitat and coming into contact with one another. And so these are the types of areas of work that we'd like to really focus on in the future. Um, H7N9, <clears throat> another story. Uh, that shows a link between uh, wildlife as being a source of the viruses, the progenitor viruses being wild bird source, but ultimately the bad virus that's killing people being something that's coming in chickens and particularly at live bird markets into people. So people are mostly getting exposed and dying after they visited live bird markets and have come into contact with contaminated environments and markets or with the poultry themselves. So here you again, perfect interface type study. Uh, where do those chickens come from? That's something we'd like to know. We don't know that very well. That's where the idea of tracking uh, livestock along the value chain is where we're interested in going with some of the work. The other thing that we're very interested in is to generate layers of live bird markets. If we know where these live bird markets are located and we know the sources and destinations of the poultry, this builds a very strong uh, set of information to allow us to manage potential uh, disease exposure in people. And then finally, the last example that I'll mention <clears throat> has to do with pastoralist movements of livestock. And in the Sahel in particular, um, there are a lot of movements that, that go from sort of the Central Africa region north, uh, both on the east and west side. And uh, when animals are moving with pastoralists, uh, so go the potential diseases that they carry. And so this is an area of work that um, FAO is, is interested to explore and, and potentially an area for the future. So I think this is really the slide to lead into just a brainstorming. I would love to hear ideas from any of you on, on how we might proceed going forward. Um, what are some new areas of work that we can accomplish? What are some things that we might be able to do? Um, I've highlighted livestock value chains but uh, other ideas are clearly welcome. Uh, we, we definitely want to do some more work on grazed domestic ducks. And then uh, are there other projects that are ongoing, maybe projects that you're involved in that are just strictly ecology projects uh, that are taking place, but where interface work could be complemented or built in. And so with that, uh, I'll stop talking, and I hope I get lots of ideas from all of you. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, the chickens are transported either in large trucks or uh, by motorcycle or by uh, makeshift tuk-tuks. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the gamut of transport mechanisms are, are quite wide ranging or bicycle. Um, so I, I guess uh, the point is that I think that um, 
you know, if we could find the right farmers who are willing to work with us, uh, I, I think that we could be marking the chickens. The, the biggest concern I have in thinking through this a little bit is that at the end, when they get to slaughter, you know, or when they get to sale before slaughter, if there's a big, large <laughs> unit attached to them, there may be stigmas associated with buying from that farmer or buying that bird or buying that group of birds. And so we may need to help facilitate cultural acceptance of, of moving animals with these big units. If we have a smaller unit, something that's less obvious uh, and, and may be hidden and not a big deal, uh, and, and we roughly know where it's going, we could be waiting for it, so to speak, at slaughter point. We could give a reward. We could give a reward uh, if you get a, a slaughterhouse transmitter. Yeah. Right. Um, that works if you have a system available to read tags. I mean, some of the slaughters are done in people's backyards, uh, you know. So there's not a real proper slaughterhouse in many of these places. There are a few, and there are some that we might be able to work with to modify their slaughterhouse so that poultry would move through those systems. So there are certain places where we could conceptually implement that. But the majority of birds are actually slaughtered at live bird markets that don't have a lot of infrastructure and that probably it would be difficult to get those readers installed because well, if you remember that map I showed you with all the dots of the map of the live bird markets, that's just you know the top. I don't know. That was the top 75 size markets. There are probably exponentially you know thousands more. So a tricky one. But but you know maybe we need to start small and we may need to select the right place to start this sort of work. Yeah, I think you could track vehicles, but um, vehicles will do a lot of other things besides just delivering the birds. Um, you know, you'll probably find out where the guy goes for karaoke uh, at night, and you'll probably find out a lot of other information. So you, you, I think you'd have a hard time teasing apart the relevant data from the legitimate data that you want. Yeah, um, people are not really comfortable sharing very well with you uh, that kind of information. There's some sensitivity in the pilots where we've tried interviewing and trying to get that information. Uh, we we don't get we don't get great data. There was a question there. Yeah, um, and had a question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for the, the high path H5N1, I mean, domestic ducks are the reservoir for the high path virus. It's, if you look at every country that's still endemic in this world, the reason they're endemic is because they have large millions of domestic duck. So until you get rid of all those domestic duck in the poultry sector, you're never going to get rid of this virus. And, and I don't think it's very reasonable to imagine that we would get rid of all those poultry. So that's, that's your source of virus, whether the mi migratory birds are north, south, east, or west, doesn't matter. These are endemic countries, and that's where the virus is seeded. Yeah, please. Sure. 
yes, I, I, uh, I agree with you, but if people are not forthcoming with what they do, <laughs> um, this is where I, I think the use of some technology to ground truth the stories that were being told would be quite valuable. And I, I think you're, you're exactly right that ultimately there needs to be some dynamic of behavior change communication that's implemented for transitioning. But it, it's not something that we even can advise on at this point because we just don't have any, any uh, confidence in the information that we're receiving in many of the questionnaire scenarios. Yeah, please. Sure. 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 I mean, the one the one example, though, you know, for example, in in Vietnam, all of our migratory bird work doesn't cover Vietnam. In fact, none of the birds migrate south to that those locations. You know, at least the ones that we think are higher risk waterfowl species. Uh, and so, basically, we don't have a wildlife blame game happening in Vietnam. Just as a case study. Uh, so, so I think governments are quick to blame. You know, you, you could s Korea right now with their outbreak uh, is a very interesting dynamic, uh, but it's clearly been uh, blamed on teal, uh, and it, you know, the livestock sector is not taking much responsibility. It's all about the wild birds, uh, and we have other scenarios like that. But I think we're we're trying to encourage, um, um, I think, just co-management because. There's no point in blaming. It, it won't matter. What are you going to do? Shoot all the wild birds of the world? No, that's not going to happen. What are you going to do? Get rid of all the poultry? No, that's not going to happen. So we're, we're, we're going to need to figure it out and coexist. And so anyway, I, I, I know the tendency. It's easier if you're an agriculture sector minister to say, oh, it's the wild birds. Our system's good. But you know, anyone that works in these countries knows the reality as well. So you know, I think there's, they, they can't say too much. Uh, because the reality is is very obvious. Yeah. Sure. Right, right, and we we are uh, we are actually working with some anthropologists on exactly this issue because uh, we have communication experts as well as anthropologists sort of on our bigger team because we we see this as necessary as well. Um, I guess because we're here for this workshop, <laughs> I was interested in pushing the technology applications at this point, but I, I completely agree with you. Well, Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a valid option. It's just we would need to frame the work to address this issue versus that issue, right? Because we're, we're, a lot of work is being focused on influenza these days because that's, you know, the pandemic concerns at a global level relate to influenzas and MERS. MERS, you know, again, we're back to bats and maybe camels, or, you know, I don't know. But anyway, that, the idea is right to maybe use some of these prototypes. Sure. Sure, and that, I think that, that fits really the pastoralist story for Africa in particular. I think that's a huge opportunity that's untapped and, and really a, a unique opportunity. It also speaks to preserving cultural identities and ways of life, which I think also has a nice dynamic. We do a lot of big <laughs> and 
Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, there is already some work being done on traceability of livestock product, in particular poultry products, and, and this concept is more applicable. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess we're, we're still exploring how to get value chain information, for example, on ducks that move for two years. What do we do? You know, I don't think the pit tag is going to allow us that that level of detail that we're looking for for really defining management structures. But in other cases, maybe if it's just local production and we know we have a good slaughterhouse to work with, then I think you're right. The pit tag may be a good option. Yeah. So I just want to bring it uh, back to uh, a field which was a new idea and it's still interesting to discuss. In butchery trade, we have to carefully track hunters within the agriculture. Mm -hmm. And this has been done for almost 15, 20 years now where a researcher goes out to the hunters and you can get the track of where all the hunters are. Have been developed in some kind of design by several people. I think if you sort of start to look where they track the people who've done these butchery works, mm -hmm. you can learn quite a lot from people who track the ducks. And that will exactly point out that Pat and Jim as well were mentioning earlier. It's much cheaper to go to the farm to get the hunters rather than sort of the tag that you put up. Right. It's a good thing to have more interaction with the field and people who work. Sure, sure. Um, well, we really need to define which system we're looking at. I mean, if you're, if you're speaking just to the domestic duck grazed in the Cambodia, Vietnam, Mekong Delta, which I think is, you know, when you speak about uh, your question, it seems to suggest that's our study area, then I would say what we're looking for is understanding um, on sort of um, a monthly basis what habitat are farmers moving their ducks to and how long are they utilizing certain rice fields? And, and you know, I, I can see us integrating satellite imagery on rice cropping dynamics concurrent with the duck movement activity. And, and what we also want to know then is where do those animals go when they cross the border? Do, do they cross all in one place? Is there, is there potentially like a funnel point? Could that be like a check station? <laughs> where we could evaluate the health of the animals before they go across and into Cambodia, and then at the same level coming back, is there a place or several places along the border that tend to be the aggregation sites that would allow us to deal with management of some of these issues? So um, I don't know if I've answered your, your question adequately, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for your ideas. <laughs>